The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you as a believer priest the opportunity to rebound and get into fellowship by utilization of 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So with that in mind, let's bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment of privacy and silent prayer. Let's begin. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study this portion of the Word of God today. May you make this a source of blessing and challenge to our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. In late May of 1940, the British troops, along with some allies, some of the French and others, were trapped at a place called Dunkirk. That was a seaport on the French coast. They were trapped there, and the entire German army was pushing toward them. They had artillery shells flying over their heads. Some were landing in their midst. They had the German Luftwaffe moving in, trying to strafe bomb them, trying to come down and just bomb these people and completely annihilate 360,000 troops. That would be three-fourths. At that time, it would be three-fourths of the entire Allied army. And three-fourths of the Allied army was trapped at Dunkirk. But something happened. There was a small air force still left in Great Britain, and they were flying over, intercepting the Luftwaffe. And they were having great success at mowing down these planes before they could get to the area of Dunkirk and bomb all of their troops there. And a lot of historians call this the miracle of Dunkirk. And in fact, when you look at it, you can only say to yourself, well, that, that had to be a miracle. The entire German army coming in on these people, they're trapped against the English Channel. There's nothing but water between them and then a huge army moving toward them. That's all that was left. That's all they had. They were in a helpless situation. But what happened, some boats from uh, England and some ships would come down and pick up these people. And from late May all the way up until June 4th, 360,000 troops were evacuated from Dunkirk. Now that was a miracle, and I know it's a miracle because we can say, and you need to write this down, point one, Jesus Christ controls history. Jesus Christ knew in eternity past that Hitler would come into his regime as an evil, satanically inspired leader filled with anti-Semitism who would move across Europe and try to take Great Britain. In, in eternity past, God knew that Great Britain would become a staging point for American, American and allied, allied invasions of Normandy, which would lead to the liberation of France and the fall of the Third Reich. Hitler thought that his Third Reich would last 1,000 years. Yeah, right. God does not permit anti-Semitism, and Hitler was straight from the hand of Satan, involved in tremendous anti-Semitism, and since Jesus Christ controls history, Jesus Christ put a stop to that, and 360,000 troops, three-fourths of the entire Allied army at that time was evacuated to Great Britain, and later the Third Reich fell. So write this down, point one, Jesus Christ controls history. Now, I know of, of a lot of Christians. There are millions of Christians in this country today who are getting involved in this environmentalism movement. They believe that if they uh, recycle their styrofoam, if they put their cans in a certain trash bag, if they do this and do that, that they're going to somehow, quote, save the world. You're not going to save the world. Jesus Christ holds this world together by the palm of his hand. There is nothing that we can do that can destroy this earth. If the rapture were to, uh, were to occur today, we would have 1,007 years left of human history, and there's not one man alive who's going to change that. And if any of you think you're out saving the world and doing all of this goody two shoe stuff, which is really evil, then you have a lot to learn because you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ who controls history. It is Jesus Christ who sustains this earth. You don't do it. Jesus Christ does. And, you, and if you have that problem, you need to mark that down. Now, under, under point one, we need to put sub point A. Sub point A, there are no accidents in human history. There are no accidents in human history. Sub point B, there are no tragedies in human history. All disasters in history are the will of God. 
subpoint C, while prophets in the Old Testament were given direct revelation of future events, the church age is not a time of prophecy, but it is rather a time of historical trends. So point C, while prophets in the Old Testament were given direct revelation of future events, the church age is not a time of prophecy. Now, there are a lot of pastors out there, many of whom have unfortunately come from Baraka Church, who are out there teaching and spouting these ideas that the rapture must occur before a certain date, such as 2048, or because Israel was founded in 1948, some reason the rapture must occur very soon and let me tell you something Paul the greatest believer in all of human history the greatest Bible teacher he knew that the rapture was imminent stating that the rapture could occur even in his day now if Paul didn't know when the rapture was going to occur then how do these other arrogant pastors and arrogant people who put dates on the future who put dates on the eschatology of the resurrection of the church the ex Anastasius of the church how are they going to know if the Apostle Paul himself didn't know? And I'm here to tell you they don't know. It is arrogance to place a date on the sovereign will of God. And when people place a date on the resurrection of the church, if they even try to make a hint of a prediction that somehow this is the rapture generation, then they are in a state of arrogance, and they're in trying to impose their own ideas on the sovereign will of God, and it's verging on blasphemy. There is no prophecy to be fulfilled during this age, and that is a point you need to write down, and I'll repeat it. Subpoint C, while prophets in the Old Testament were given direct revelation of future events, the church age is not a time of prophecy. Now turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 10, verse 14. Exodus 10, 14, I'll read the first part of this verse. And as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked and beheld that the Egyptians were marching after them. Now you see the Israelites at this time were in quite a precarious position just as the English and the other allies were in a precarious position at Dunkirk. The Jews of that time, they were trapped against the Red Sea along with Moses. They were trapped. They didn't have anywhere to go and the chariot army with its cloud, billowing clouds of dust moving in toward them, the earth shaking as they move in closer and closer. And here they are in a helpless situation. They're trapped. They're in a helpless situation. These people in Israel, they've had no military training. They have a military genius on their hands, which is Moses, who is their leader, but they've had no training. They're completely helpless. They have no weapons, and they look out and they see the chariot army moving toward them. So what happened? Let's look at Exodus. Well, let's see. Let's take some points first. Jesus Christ controls history. Therefore, it was God's will that the Egyptian chariot forces would pursue Israel. You see, Israel, at that time, if they were mature, they could have looked out, they could have seen the chariot army moving toward them, and they could have understood immediately that that was the will of God because there are no accidents in human history. They could have looked out there, they could have seen the chariot army, they could have known they were coming, and they could have said, well, I know this is God's will. And it, anything in history is God's will when you see it. But they didn't say that because they weren't a mature group of people. Now let's take sub-point D. God allows man's wrath in human history because even the wrath of man shall praise God. Now you see, God in eternity past knew that the armored forces of the Pharaoh would move in toward the children of Israel. God knew that this was going to happen, and he allowed this wrath, the wrath of Pharaoh, to come down on Israel for a very important reason, and we'll look at this later, but right now just get down sub-point D. God allows man's wrath in human history, because even the wrath of man shall praise him. Now let's look at Exodus Chapter 14, verse 10, part B. And they, the children of Israel, became frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. All right, let's take some points on fear. Point one, fear is a sin. Fear is a sin. If you are a Christian and you are in a state of fear, the moment you fear anything, bam, you are out of fellowship. Just as soon as I snap my fingers, you fear, boom, you're out of fellowship. There's no way around it. That's the way it is because fear is a sin. Now, the children of Israel, what did they do? They looked out over this chariot army and they became frightened immediately. 
Here they are, the children of Israel. They were already out of fellowship because they were losers anyway. But if they weren't, and they looked out, and they saw this army, and immediately they feared them, boom, they're out of fellowship. So we know the children of Israel here are out of fellowship. So what do they do in this state of being out of fellowship? They cry out to the Lord. Now I want to tell you something. If you are in a state of sin... If you are grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit as a church-age believer, your prayers are not heard. You are out of fellowship. God does not hear those prayers. And if you are out of fellowship, there is no power. The filling of the Holy Spirit is the power of your spiritual life. It enables you to utilize all of the doctrines. It enables you to apply all of the doctrines that you have learned. Now let's see here. What could the people of children of Israel have done? Here they are in a state of fear. What should they have done? Should they have started claiming promises? Well, if you're in a state of fear and you claim a promise, it's not going to mean anything to you. I remember my father and I and my mother, we would be driving in the car, and my aunt, she she's passed away now, but we would get a kick out of her because every time we would drive under a tunnel, she would start to say the 23rd Psalm because she would get scared and her hands would start sweating. And she would always say the 23rd Psalm as we drove through a tunnel because she was worried. She had this claustrophobia that somehow the the uh, earth was going to cave in on her and she was going to die. Or if we were going in a tunnel underwater that the water was going to cave on us and we were all going to die. And she would start to fear. So she would claim the 23rd Psalm. Now, did that 23rd Psalm help her at all? No, it did not. The 23rd Psalm, while she was saying it, she was in a state of fear. It didn't mean anything to her. It was just words. And that's because when you are out of fellowship, when you are in a state of sin, doctrine becomes ineffective. You can, you can be the greatest doctrinal person in the entire world, and if you're out of fellowship, that doctrine you know becomes ineffective. And it's the same with prayer. If you're out of fellowship, your prayer is going to be ineffective. And fear will take you out of fellowship. So we know from Exodus 14:10b that these babies in Israel, they were out of fellowship. These children of Israel, they were, they were completely out of the will of God. So what is it about fear? You know, Franklin Roosevelt said this one time, and I'm sure he didn't write it because... He was a little too stupid for this, but his speech, re speech writer, of course, he made a, a very good statement, and Franklin Roosevelt quoted it, and it's a very famous phrase, and he said, We have nothing to fear but fear itself. And that's very true. As we were moving into World War II there, and he was trying to encourage the American people, the fact is fear. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. Fear is a very crippling thing. It will turn very courageous men into cowards in seconds. Fear is a powerful thing. And fear will take you out of fellowship, and that is the point you need to take for point one. Fear is a sin and will immediately take you out of fellowship. Now for point two. Fear is irrational. I remember my parents and I, we were flying across the country, going to Portland, Oregon, and we were flying over the Rocky Mountains. Now, in the Rocky Mountains, the winds can howl up the side of those mountains sometimes, and what happens, the air condenses and cools, it forms clouds, and the cloud, excuse me, the cloud tops get forced upward, and they can go as high as 40 and 50,000 feet, and it, it forms these free thunderstorms. Well, as we were flying in, in this jet across the Rocky Mountains, we got caught in one of these freak thunderstorms. And as we were flying through it, I guess the thunderstorms, cloud tops, were, could have been as high as 40,000 feet. We were at about 35,000 feet, and as we were flying across the top of this thunderstorm, we were in the top of the sun, thunderstorm, actually. You could look out of the window, and I had a window seat, and I was looking out of the window, and I could see the wings, and they were bobbing up and down. And they were bobbing so ferociously, it looked like a bird almost, the way it was flopping. And uh, it's a good thing the wings are very resilient. And I remember I quipped to my father as I was looking out the window. I was having a good time bouncing up and down through this turbulence. It was actually quite entertaining and watching these wings bounce up and down and just watching how resilient and almost like plastics if if you ever uh touch the wing of a jet and you try to move it yourself it's not going to budge but here we are in the forces of nature and this wing is just bouncing up and down and i quipped to my father i said look dad it looks like that wing's about to rip off and i wouldn't have said it if i had known that there was a lady in front of us who was scared to death of flying I mean, she was so scared. She was gripping onto her seat there, 
gripping onto the plane seat. She probably left her handprint in it. I should have looked at it before I left. And uh, she was gripping onto it, and you could tell she was breathing harder, and she was scared. She probably had sweaty palms. Her heart was probably beating faster, and she was squeezing onto this chair. And after I said, hey, Dad, the wing's going to rip off, uh, she really dug into that, really dug into that chair, and, and she really got extremely frightened. And I wouldn't have done that. If, I wouldn't have equipped that way if I didn't know that there was somebody who was frightened on the plane. But... Nonetheless, that's what happened, and this is the point we need to take because fear is irrational. Do you know if that plane, if that, if the wing of that plane had ripped off and we spun into the earth, her grabbing onto that seat wouldn't have stopped her from dying any more than just relaxing. If we would have hit the ground, she would have been as flat as a pancake. It wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered if she was gripping onto that seat or not. She would have been as flat as a pancake. That's why fear is irrational. There is nothing rational about fear. She should have enjoyed the ride just like I was. And if the wing had ripped off, I would have enjoyed spinning into the earth and hitting the ground, dying, and going to be face to face with the Lord. You see, there is nothing to fear. And if you fear death as a believer, then you haven't grown up very much. Because the Bible tells us, the Bible promises us, that if we are facing death, and, if, and once we die, we go to a place of no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, no more death, the old things have passed away. So any type of fear, fear of death, that's irrational. The Apostle Paul said, as for me, living Christ, dying prophet. So you see, there should be no fear in the Christian life. And a lot of times it takes a lot of us to grow up a lot. I remember when I was a young kid and we went to the we went to a park and they had this roller coaster there and they had other roller coasters. I like to ride on the ones that didn't go upside down, but my grandpa and my father were urging me to get on this roller coaster, but it went upside down, and I had this fear of going upside down. I was a young kid, and I was afraid that I'd fall out of the seat or something. And finally, they got me to get on that thing, and I was scared to death. I mean, I wasn't enjoying this ride at all. It started to go up, and I was clenching, clenching my fist, and I was just hoping it would get over with. And then it went through. I was scared through the whole thing, but once it was over, I realized, I said, hey, man, that, that was kind of fun. Let's do it again. You see, fear is irrational. People would get on that roller coaster all the time. No one was ever hurt, and yet me, in my state of fear, I was missing out on some fun because I had fear in my life. So point two, fear is irrational. The lady on the plane, she was irrational as it was bobbing up and down. I was irrational for not wanting to go upside down on the roller coaster out of fear. Now let's look at the children of Israel. The irrationality of the children of Israel was because they did not understand that Jesus Christ controls history. They may have had it taught to them by their priest and others. They probably were told the promises of God and they had some of the promises of God and they just didn't realize that God is in control. Now, now I see these signs. Sometimes it makes my skin crawl sometimes when I'm driving down the road and I see the signs on the back of their, their little stickers they put on the back of their cars. And it says, God is my co-pilot. Wrong! God's not your co-pilot. God is the pilot. God's plan is going to go on whether you fly along with it or not. God's plan is going to fly whether you want to go along or not. God is not the co-pilot. God is the pilot. And you need to write this down. Point two, fear is irrational. God is in control, and God is the pilot. And God's plan is going to go on whether you go along with it or not. Now let's take down point three. If you are in a state of fear, emotion is your God. Now let's take a look at Exodus chapter 14 verse 11. Then they, the Exodus generation, said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Now you see, this is completely 
asinine and irrational. And you can go back to point two. Fear is irrational. These people in Israel, this, these children of Israel are being completely irrational. There is no thought content to this. Why would Moses, in a million years, want to bring the children of Israel out against the Red Sea so that they could be annihilated with, by the Pharaoh's army? It's completely irrational. Moses did not want to do that. And here are these people whining and crying and complaining and blaming Moses for their problems. This is complete insanity. There is no thought, and the spiritual life is a life of thinking. Emotion is not part of the spiritual life, and fear is an emotion. Now write this down. The spiritual life is thinking. It says in the Bible, we have the thinking of Christ. Now you can tell that the children of Israel at this point, they're not thinking. They're just in a state of complete emotional irrationality. Now let's look at Exodus chapter 14 verse 12. And the children of Israel still speaking to Moses, Is this not the word we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone so that we might serve the Egyptians? Now here they are blaming Moses for their own decisions. They're blaming him for their own decisions. They decided to go along with Moses. You know, he didn't force one person to go along with him. All too many of those people made a choice, and they decided to go along with Moses. And now that they get into a jam, what do they do? They say, is it not the word we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone so that we might serve the Egyptians? Now, Christians today... They're blaming God for their own decisions, and this is basically what the people of Israel are doing. They're blaming Moses, God's servant, for the predicament that they're in. And a lot of Christians do this today. They might marry the wrong person, and they'll say, Oh God, why did you let this happen to me? Now such a statement is absolutely repugnant. That decision was made by you, and you have done it to yourself. You are in a state of misery because you made a bad decision. Immature people blame others for their own bad decisions. When I was a young kid, I was playing outside, and I had some friends. And uh, two of these friends, they were, we got this frog. This frog was hopping around. We thought it was pretty neat. So I picked up this frog, and there was my neighbor, and they had a swimming pool. And one of my friends said, hey, Andy, why don't you put that frog in the swim pool and we could watch it swim around and I thought that was a pretty good idea so I placed that frog in the swimming pool and it started to swim around and we were all having just a great time playing with this frog as it was swimming around until I heard a voice and it was my mother's voice and she said uh, Andy what are you doing now I'm being a little tame here it was a little louder than that but she asked me what I was doing, and I could tell that she was a little upset, so I said, uh, well, my friends here, they told me to put this frog in the swimming pool. So, you see, I was, I was immediately, I was thinking, I was being a bright kid, I was thinking, you know, if I blame my friends for this, I might get out of this situation, but I didn't get out of that situation. My mom said, what? And uh, she brought me inside, and she gave me a little treatment with the rod, and I realized that you really can't get away with anything. You can't blame others for your own bad decisions. I took that frog, and I put it in someone else's pool. I was messing with someone else's property, and I got in trouble. That was my own bad decision. And let me tell you, I was a kid then, and I want to tell you something. Only babies blame others for their problems. Now let's look at Exodus 14:12, Part B. Quote, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. You know, I remember back in the 1960s, I heard about it, and uh, a lot of the people back then, they were saying, uh, you know, it's, red, it's better to be red than dead. Wrong! It's not better to be red than dead. It's better to be dead than to live under a system of slavery, and that's what the... The Egyptians were, the uh, Israelites were living under, under Egyptian rule. They were living in slavery, and they wanted to go back to slavery. It's better to be dead than to be in slavery. 
and we need to take some points. Point one, immature people have no capacity for freedom. The people of Israel, when they said it, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians and to die in the wilderness, these people who are saying this, they have no capacity for freedom. And immature people have no capacity for freedom. Point two, immature people demand security over freedom. You know, we have this seatbelt law. It came up quite a, quite a few years ago. And the seatbelt law is for our security. And the people of America accepted it because the people of America demand security over freedom. It should be a choice. You want to wear a seatbelt? That should be your choice. You don't want to? You bought the car. You can snap it in or click it out. It's nobody's business. But no, the people of America don't understand freedom. They don't have capacity for freedom. They're becoming just like the Exodus generation, much like the X generation of today. The X generation of today is almost exactly like the Exodus generation during Moses' time. They are no different. Now, what's wrong with the people of Israel here? When they say, when they blame Moses for the fact that the Egyptian army is coming in, when they say that it, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians, well, first of all, their eye is not on the solution. Their eye is on the problem. And we can see this in verse 12b because the, they say it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Look, they are thinking about serving the Egyptians. They're not thinking about serving the Lord. They're thinking about serving the Egyptians. That's their whole problem. The people of Israel, they have their eyes on the problem and not the solutions. Now let me tell you something. There are no problems in this life. There are only solutions. Can you look at it that way? Because, look, in the church age, we have ten problem-solving devices. Developed, they were developed by Colonel Thiem. They're all in the Bible. We have ten problem-solving devices as members of the church age. These are problem-solving devices. We don't have problems. We only have problem-solvers. We only have solutions. We don't have problems. Can you look at it that way? There are no problems in your life. There are only solutions. And let's take a review of these solutions. We have number one, which is rebound. That's the utilization of First John 1, 9. If we name our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. That's one. And what rebound does, as a result of rebound, it gives us the power of this spiritual life. Without it, our spiritual life is doomed. That's why rebound is so important. Lewis Berry Schaefer said that rebound, that, uh, well, he put it this way. He said, First John 1, 9 is the John 3.16 of Christendom. That's how important it is. John 3.16, if we believe that Jesus Christ we believe in Jesus Christ, we're saved. That's basically what John 3.16 says, and as a result of that, we receive the forgiveness of sins. Now, in Christendom, once we're Christians, if we sin and we utilize 1 John 1, 9, again, we are forgiven of sins that we've committed during our Christian life. Therefore, you might want to write this down. It is a very, it's a, it should be a famous quote. It's not, but John 3.16 is the first John, or excuse me, 1 John 1 9 is the John 3 16 of Christendom. Now let's take number two, the filling of the Holy Spirit. That is our second problem solving device. Without the filling of the Holy Spirit, nothing else matters. We can't apply anything. Number three is the faith rest drill. For example, 1 Peter 5 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. That is the utilization of the faith rest drill. Then we have number four, grace orientation. As in uh, Genesis 50 15, you see Joseph, well, let's quote Genesis, Genesis 50 15 here. You don't have to turn there. When Joseph's brother saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for the evil which we did to him. Now you see, Joseph had no intention of repaying evil for evil. Joseph had grace orientation. He applied the same grace to his, to his brothers that God has applied to him. Joseph is no different. He was saved by grace. His brothers were saved by grace. And he employs the same grace operation toward his brothers. And he was not going to repay evil for evil. 
And then number five is a problem solving device. We have doctrinal orientation. This is when we put everything into perspective. This is when we start to get a glimpse of living our lives in the light of eternity. Titus 1 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. And once we start to solidify our grace orientation, we get some doctrine under our belt, we can have some doctrinal orientation, and then we break out into maturity. And when we break out into maturity, we have a personal sense of destiny. You know, Moses had a personal sense of destiny, and we'll see that later. But right now, we're just going through this list. Number seven is a personal love for God the Father, and that works in tandem with number eight, which is a pers an impersonal love for all mankind. For example, John 15, uh, 17, These things I command you, that you love one another. Now, this love, is, it isn't an, an emotional love. This love is an impersonal love. It's, it's a part of virtue. Number seven and eight, that's part of the virtue envelope. envelope. And we'll study more in detail in this in later studies, but right now we're just going to skim through this as part of your problem-solving devices. Just to let you know that you have some problem-solving devices. There are no problems in this life. There are only solutions. And number nine of the ten problem-solving devices, you have plus H, or sharing the happiness of God. And you can see that in... Hebrews 12:2, in which we can share the same happiness that Jesus Christ had on the cross through the intake of the Bible doctrine. And let's quote Hebrews 12:2 here. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now that we've reviewed the 10 problem-solving devices that are for the church age, let's uh, shift gears here and take a look at Moses. Now there's something very different about Moses and those idiots of the Exodus generation. Moses did not have his eyes on the problem. He had his eyes on the solution. Here are the people of Israel trapped against the Red Sea, and they can see this army moving in, the billowing clouds of dust, the, the shaking of the ground as this great chariot army moves in toward them. Now, what did Moses say to him? You can see a completely different person. Out of the two million people that are in Israel at this time, they're all losers, but we can see a winner here in Exodus 14, 13, and this is what it says. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand fast and watch the deliverance of the Lord that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians that you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you today. You keep silent. Now, you see, this is a man who has his eyes on the solution. He doesn't see any problems. There are no problems for Moses. Moses looks out at this Egyptian army, and let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ is far more real to him than that Egyptian army that is rushing in toward him because Moses has his eyes on the solution. Moses is the man for the crisis. He stood in the gap. Now, Moses was a powerful man. He was tall and he was handsome, and if you're wondering why I shouted that, where he gave his very great, eloquent, short speech, it's because Moses was a very powerful man. He was tall and he was handsome. In fact, he killed one of those Egyptian slave masters just by popping him with one fist. He pivoted himself and he hit that Egyptian, and that Egyptian fell dead from one punch. This man was big and he was powerful. He was far more tall. He was a lot taller than me and a lot more handsome, and that's not really saying much, but but God raised him up for the crisis, and God uses prepared people. Now, it wasn't necessarily the physical strength of Moses that, that got him promoted. It was his spiritual strength, and we see his spiritual strength when he says to these rebellious people, this rebellious generation, you know, Moses, he wasn't only facing... He, he wasn't only facing the problem, which wasn't a problem to him, but he looked out. He wasn't only facing this Egyptian army moving toward him, but he was facing two million idiots who were blaming him for the fact that he was there, and he was their leader. And so here he is getting punished on both sides. And what does Moses do? Does he start to whine? Does he start to cry? No. Moses says, do not fear. Stand fast and watch the deliverance of the Lord that he will accomplish for you today. 
for the Egyptians that you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Because the Lord will fight for you today. Now you shut up. Now that's basically what he told those two million rebellious people, and that's what they needed to, to hear. He basically neutralized the fear that was in their soul. Sure, they, they were still fearing, but I guarantee you they shut up. Because when Moses said, shut up, well, you better shut up. Because he's a big man, he had a very eloquent voice. And I'm sure that that neutralized all the fear in their soul when they heard this great promise from Moses, which was, he was the speaker for God. And when they heard this great promise, when they heard that the Lord would fight for them today, I'm sure they just stood there and they froze, all two million of them, because they all heard him. Now here's Moses. He is the most eloquent speaker of the Old Testament, possibly even the New Testament, with even the New Testament with the exception of the Apostle Paul, who is the greatest believer of all time, in my opinion. But here is Moses. He's a great eloquent speaker. Now so you don't feel inferior, or so that you don't feel like, well, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big failure. I could never get up and do what Moses did. You know, Moses had his problems, too. Before this occurred, Moses was called by God, and God himself spoke to Moses, and he said, Moses, I want you to lead the people out of the land of Egypt, and I want you to lead them to freedom. And you know what Moses did? There, it was a completely different Moses. You know what was wrong, Moses? When God said that, he all of a sudden had a spark of fear in his life, which neutralized his spiritual life. And Moses said, um, but, but God, um, um, please don't give this task to me because I'm not an eloquent speaker and I can't get in front of these people. I can't go talk to the Pharaoh. And, he, and what was wrong with Moses was he was fear. He had some fear in his life. He feared that the Pharaoh would reject him when he goes up and tells him to release his people and then he feared what the people would think of him he he was how how are they going to know that i'm a leader and he started having this fear even though that god himself personally talked to moses and said look moses you're the man for the crisis you go out and you lead these people out of slavery and then moses begged god oh please god um i, I can't do this I'm, I'm just not an eloquent speaker which was really an excuse because Moses is an extremely eloquent speaker, and we can almost read it in the words, even in the English, right here. We can see that Moses is an extremely eloquent speaker, so he makes up this excuse in a state of fear. And so you know what God does? God, in his sense of humor, says to Moses, well, we'll have Aaron here. We'll let Aaron, mealy-mouthed Aaron, that's what he is. He's just a mealy-mouthed, soft-spoken, really quiet and there's nothing wrong with being quiet and soft-spoken, but Aaron he, Aaron was just a plain wimp. And so in God, in his sense of humor, he said, Okay, Moses, we'll let Aaron be your mouthpiece. You tell Aaron what to say, and he'll speak, since you're not so eloquent. And so Moses agreed to that. And you know what happened? They had to go and they had to see the Pharaoh, and they're going up to the Pharaoh, and Aaron gets up there, and I can imagine it now. I can see Aaron now. He can say, You know, Pharaoh... um, you know, if you want to, maybe you could let the people go out and um, give a sacrifice to the Lord because we have a holy day coming up and we really need this time off from work. And Pharaoh, if you could please. And then right in the middle of Aaron being his mealy mouth self, his own compromising self, I can imagine Moses and his great power and now his eloquence comes through you can see it burning in his bones he just wants to get out and shout and you can see him push Aaron to the side and he looks that Pharaoh right in the eyes and he says Pharaoh you let my people go now that's Moses all of a sudden that fear that was in his soul was replaced with the doctrine that he had learned and Moses had a lot of doctrine even at that time when he was fearing he had a lot of doctrine and he snapped out of that when he, he and Aaron were standing up there he was in fellowship. He snapped out of out of his state of fear, and he pushed Aaron to the side, and he let that Pharaoh know. Now, that's Moses. Now, we need to take a principle down here. Moses, when he was leading the people, and he was about to lead them across the Red Sea, Moses had an absolute confidence in God, which results in courage toward people. Moses did not have his eye on the problem. He didn't look out at that Egyptian army and get all scared and say, oh my, that's a huge army, what are we going to do? Oh my goodness. 
He didn't cry out to the Lord, Oh, God, help me, just like the degenerate people of the Exodus degeneration did. No, Moses had confidence in God. He already had the doctrine. Therefore, once you grow in this spiritual life, you will, you'll reach this in your life. You'll, you'll have times in your life when your confidence in God is going to be challenged. It's going to be challenged by your friends. It's going to be challenged by your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your wife, your husband. But guess what? Once you reach a certain stage in your spiritual life, you're going to have an absolute confidence in, confidence in God, which results in courage toward people. And that's what Moses had. And that's what you can have right now in this church age. You can have that cognitive invincibility, that knowledge of doctrine, that application of doctrine that will make you invincible to any problem. You're not going to look at life through the spectrum of problems. You're going to look at life through a spectrum of solutions, and your life is going to be marvelous. It's not going to be pathetic like the pathetic losers of the Exodus generation. It's going to be marvelous, just like Moses' life was marvelous. He lived a marvelous life in spite of the fact that he was constantly, constantly being harassed by his own people. He had a marvelous and a very happy wife life. And speaking of wives, he had a marvelous wife as well. But again, let's take down this point. Absolute confidence in God results in courage toward people. Now let's take down some points of history. Point one. History is influenced by the spiritual life of believers within that nation. You see, the Exodus generation, they were filled with two million born-again believing losers. They were all losers. Their spiritual life was non compass menace. They were completely, completely out of the spiritual life. They had the promises of God, but they did never utilize the promises of God. And there was only one man who stood in the gap, and that one man was Moses, and he was the man for the crisis. And the entire history of Israel was influenced by this one man, Moses. Therefore, point one, history is influenced by the spiritual life of believers within a nation. Point two, the human solution, i.e. politics, is never a solution. You know, Moses, he wasn't like the, the mealy-mouthed politicians we have today who get up and they stand up on an issue. They never stand on principles. They always wafer and they try to find the most popular issue to stand on. Do you know if Moses had been a politician and he had said – he had took a poll of the people and said, okay – um, I'm going to take a poll of the majority of the people here, and I'm going to see what they want to do, and then what they want to do, I'm just going to lead them to the place where they want to be. And you know what the people of Israel would have said? They would have said, take us back to Pharaoh. Now, that would have been a stupid thing to do, and Moses was no politician. Moses was no compromising person. He knew exactly what God wanted him to do, and he did it. He had his eyes on the solution. He had his eyes on God during that whole entire thing. Therefore, point two, the human solution, i.e. politics, is not a solution. Point three, nations prosper, not on the basis of who is in political office, but on the basis of spiritual impact. David said, My cup runneth over. Now, when David said this, this is an example of blessing by association. And David also said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. This is the generational impact of a spiritually mature believer such as David and Moses. Now, the United States of America is here right now because there are a few invisible heroes out there. There are a few people out there who have gone on in their spiritual life, and they have reached the status of pleroma tu theu, the fullness of blessings from God. And those blessings have overflowed, and that's why God is holding his hand out in essence, and he is stopping the storm clouds of the fifth cycle of discipline from overrunning this nation. It's because just a few people and their spiritual impact, not the political impact, Bill Clinton hasn't saved this nation, not even Ronald Reagan with his great establishment principles. He didn't save this nation. This nation is here today because of a few spiritually mature believers who have gone on to play Roma and who have an impact that will not be known until we get to heaven. Therefore, point four, 
the impact of great believers in the Old Testament is visible, while the impact of church age believers is invisible, and it won't be fully revealed until the Bema, or evaluation of the church age believers after the resurrection. And let's go back to point three. That was a long point. Let me narrow it down here for you. Point three, nations prosper not on the basis of who is in office, but on the basis of spiritual impact. David said, My cup runneth over. And this is an example of blessing by association. David also said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. And this is the genera generational impact of a spiritually mature believer. The United States is still here, not because of politicians, but only because of a few Pleroma believers who are standing in the gap, just as Moses stood in the gap when he said, Stand fast and watch the deliverance of the Lord. The Lord will fight for you today. And there are a few people. Now in point four, we see that this impact of the church age believer, and this is applicable to us, is invisible. And there are a few invisible people. You don't know who they are. I don't know who they are. But we should thank God for them because they're the only reason why this nation is still going. There is no reason why this nation should still be here. We are just like the Exodus generation. Do you know the Exodus generation received so much grace in receiving such a great visible hero at that time? But God controls history. Jesus Christ controls history. And he knew that the people of Israel needed to go to the promised land. And he knew that that generation would be a degeneration, that exodus generation. He knew all of this, and he graced them out by giving them the greatest, most eloquent speaker, a very handsome, tall man, a man who could, who could put most men today to shame. And he, they had this, and they had some great grace. And look, here's Moses. He had everything going for him. He had a great spiritual life. He had a great physique. A great physique. And here he is, and guess what? He's under a lot of pressure. Now, this is a principle. Once you grow up spiritually, it's not all roses. Once you reach spiritual maturity, that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be adversities in life. Sure, there are going to be adversities. The only difference between a spiritually mature believer and a spiritually immature believer is the fact that the mature believer knows that there are solutions. The mature believer knows how to use those solutions. An immature believer... They either don't want to know the solutions or they're just growing up. And for those who are growing up, just hang in there. But for those of you, those people, and which is the majority of people, they just don't care about the Word of God. They're going to live out their days in misery. And they may never come under the same adversities that a mature believer will come under. Look, here's Moses. He had the adversity of leading two, two million rebellious uh, believers, and also the adversity of dealing with a chariot army courting, coming toward him. What made Moses so different? It wasn't the fact that he didn't have any adversities. Sure, he had adversities, but he didn't have problems. He had solutions. The only problem were two million believers there who didn't have enough faith to come in out of the rain. That was the whole problem. Now, tomorrow night we'll continue our study of Moses. We'll look into the doctrine of grace and how the people of Israel were graced out as Moses stretched out his staff over the Red Sea. It was split by God. They walked across dry land. We'll see the reaction to all of that as we continue our study tomorrow night. Therefore, these next few moments are devoted to prayer, and let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity of studying the Word of God. May this be a source of blessing and challenge to us, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.